Well, good morning, uh, everyone. Um, Fifteen years ago, Roger Martin, who was the, currently who was the dean at uh, at Rotman at the time, <clears throat> and I flew down to uh, Omaha to uh, have a uh, two-hour talk with Warren Buffett. A uh, couple of interesting aspects to it. When I first wrote uh, Mr. Buffett to see if we could come down and talk to him, he said, "You folks looking for money?" And I said, no, we don't need any money. He said, oh, in that case, come on down, OK? Uh, and um, you know, the principle of value investing is based on um, margin of safety. The dean and I were scheduled to fly out around 10 o'clock for a 2 o'clock session with uh, Mr. Buffett. And Roger called me the night before. He said, Eric, I've changed our flight to 6 in the morning. You have to get up at 4. And it turned out, he said, we haven't left enough margin. It turned out. That second flight was actually canceled. We never would have gotten there. The trip wouldn't have happened, and none of this would have, would have taken place. So he was absolutely right. Um, I had just received this uh, endowed chair in, uh, in value investing. I'm now chair emeritus, and uh, my, uh, my colleague, uh, uh, Partha, now has the, uh, has the chair. So I'm the chair emeritus, and Partha uh, is the chair. A little confusing, but John's happy. He gets a double. Uh, Double kick on the uh, on the name. Um, so I was looking for some insights from uh, from Mr. Buffett on uh, on education. I'd been down to Columbia. Uh, I know Martha, you had actually trained there as well. If I'm not mistaken, the Columbia. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And um, um, just wanted to see what uh, what he had to say. Well, there were indeed some terrific insights. So we're sitting in his fabled office at uh, Brookshire Hathaway. And uh, I observed all these photos of Buffett with all these famous people, a lot of presidents and so on. So I started pointing to uh, some of the pictures, and he sort of shrugged. He said, you know, eh, they're important people, but none of that really matters. There's only one important picture <clears throat> in this room. And that's, he pointed behind me, he said, that's uh, Benjamin Graham. Um, Buffett had studied under uh, Benjamin Graham at uh, Columbia. Apparently, he was the only one to have ever earned a, uh, an A-plus from Graham. And uh, he initially worked for uh, Graham's hedge fund. In fact, um, Buffett himself tells the story of how he approached uh, Benjamin Graham after he, had, after he had graduated and said, you know, Ben, I'd like to, like to work for you. And Ben said, well, you did get an A-plus. So, I will hire you, but I'm not going to pay you anything, and I think I'm overpaying you. Okay, so, um, Senator Graham, that, uh, that Buffett, arguably, uh, along with Sir John Templeton, the two most famous uh, value investors uh, in history, is where they honed their skills. So what does all of that have to do with today's, this morning's topic? Well, in my view, everything. Value investing and the impact of standard and non-standard accounting disclosure really owes much, not all, but much of its genesis to Benjamin Graham. So Graham started his career in um, 1926 when he founded Graham uh, Newman Corp. In 1928, he taught a course in security analysis at Columbia. His observations on the Great Crash and its many causes was a major impetus for his um, ensuing contributions in both finance, investment finance, and indeed in accounting. He was one of the first to recognize that security analysis and valuation greatly underdeveloped skill and discipline at that time. He was critical of so-called security analysts who recommended stocks based mainly on qualitative factors, as well as applying what he considered to be poorly motivated analyses of firms' financial positions. His approach was indeed on number crunching, not on qualitative factors, on techniques that could be universally applied, on metrics and measures such as PE multiples, debt to equity ratios, dividend records, debt current assets, book values, earnings growth, all of which, to be derived, had to be available from publicly available sources. To 
to work. The sources had to be good. And in the late 1920s and early 1930s, the sources were not particularly good. Graham was also critical of companies and critical of, accountant, and critical of accountants for their what he considered to be their inconsistent, sloppy financial reporting. As you know, accounting was a fairly rudimentary state at that time. There was no gap. That, that gap didn't emerge until 1939, and accounting standards were very loose. Anthony. Hello, Lance. Uh, I apologize. Now, now, I can speed, now I can speed up a bit. Okay. You're muted. You're, you're <laughs> on next. <laughs> oh my. All right, well, I'm ready. Relax. Get a, get a coffee if you need one. I'll talk slow. Okay. 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 Um, over the years, um, under the leadership and persistence of Graham and others, fundamental security analysis, which is the origin of value investing, became a profession including the introduction of the CFA professional designation. At the same time, in the post-crash era, with the Securities and Exchange Commission and the OSC, regulating accounting standards, GAAP developed. Superior security analysis is based on the quality of the accounting numbers at the base. Graham saw risk in a very interesting and insightful way. Uh, quoting him, many common stocks do involve risks of deterioration, but it is our thesis that a properly executed investment in common stocks does not carry any substantial risk of this sort, and that therefore it should not be chosen merely because of the element of price fluctuation. So we have the, you know, this current emphasis on volatility. Graham didn't believe that volatility was risk. His view of risk was poor research that if you did good research, it was going to, uh, going to pay out and you could ignore the short-term fluctuations that were taking place in the, uh, in the marketplace. So we had the move towards standardization. Standardization, however, has a cost, and it can dampen um, insight, too. So gap earnings are standardized, among other things, include one-time extraordinary, what we used to call non-recurring items, uh, gap treatment of intangibles, increases challenges for valuing biotech companies, technology companies, social media companies. So many companies today present non-GAAP measures, which some say provide greater insight into company performance and value, and the focus on recurring events only. However, non-GAAP EPS is not standardized can present serious distortions, particularly if there are systematic overstatements. So to address this important issue of the use of uh, non-GAAP and other such measures, I'm pleased to present a very distinguished um, panel who are going to discuss the features and challenges